Thank you, Noah. <clears throat> so actually, um, uh, what, I, what I want to say uh, is very simple. And uh, that is um, our exploration together uh, over the next few days, um, in part is to transmit uh, interesting and important content, but it's also to uh, engender the, the kind of knowing and loving um, that will be a resource for the uh, bodhisattva action that I uh, am sure all of us are engaged in, in terms of what is happening in our world today. And on behalf of UPIA and Mind and Life Europe, I just, I thank the faculty with all my heart for uh, coming together for this very important convocation. And Al. Thank you, Roshi. So we're going to be starting our, our first talk of the day with Evan Thompson. Evan was uh, introduced and introduced himself to you uh, in the session from uh, yesterday. So I'm going to turn it right over to him. And then following Evan's talk, Hannah DeYeager is going to be serving as our uh, discussant uh, and facilitator for uh, some interchange with the other faculty. And uh, if there is time allowing, uh, getting a couple of uh, questions or observations from our participants. So Evan, please take it away. Thank you. I need to have, <clears throat> excuse me, screen sharing enabled uh, in order to share my screen. So I'm not sure who does that. There you go, on your Evan, end. you should have it now. All right, let's, uh, whoops, hold on. I think this will share and uh, presenter. All right, is that visible? The title screen, Enacted Hope and Coordinated Knowing? All good? It's good. All right, let me just minimize something over here. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor <clears throat> to be our first speaker. I'm going to be talking about enacting hope and coordinated knowing. And now I just have to get it to advance properly. Here we go. I want to start with the idea of uncertainty, which is one of the themes of our meeting. As Al said last night in introducing us, a lot seems uncertain and unpredictable right now. Who would have thought a few years ago that we'd now be in the midst of a global pandemic? Millions of people have died and the livelihoods of billions of people have been disrupted. Scientists have rushed to create new vaccines, including a new kind of vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, which in turn have huge implications for preventing and treating many other diseases. And meanwhile, all of this is happening against the backdrop of the planetary climate crisis, which makes other deadly pandemics increasingly likely. Given doubt, instability, and uncertainty, we typically try to latch on to certainty. Some extreme ways we do this are probably obvious to many of us here. For example, climate change denial, pandemic denial, conspiracy theories, these are among other things, ways of trying to find certainty in the face of frightening disruption and uncertainty in our lives. But there are other ways we latch on to certainty that aren't so obvious. Take the very idea of crisis as it figures in how we think about planetary climate change. The idea of crisis or emergency is a way of framing time. It's a way of framing our present in relation to our future and our past. And it can also reflect a craving for certainty. Here, wanting certainty takes the form of what philosopher and indigenous scholar Kyle White calls crisis epistemology. And this is the first thing that I want to talk about in my talk today. Let's start with the word crisis itself. It comes from an ancient Greek word meaning decision. A crisis is a time of intense difficulty, 
or danger, when we have to make crucial decisions. In late Middle English around 1500, a crisis meant the turning point of a disease, indicating either death or recovery. Treating climate change as a crisis allows us to frame it as an emergency for which immediate action is required. But climate change isn't a crisis in the way that the present pandemic is. It's something more and something else. It's an inescapable, irreversible ecological mutation and planetary transformation. The current pandemic may end if we're lucky, but climate change will last. The challenge it poses isn't how to find a one-time solution like a vaccine. A vaccine isn't even in itself a one-time solution actually. It's more complicated than that. The challenge with climate change is how to lessen its severity, especially for those peoples and nations who are most vulnerable, while finding different ways to inhabit the planetary biosphere different ways to live in the planet. And please notice that I say in and not on. My point here is that framing climate change as only or primarily a crisis or emergency can be a way of latching onto certainty in the face of the inherent uncertainty and unpredictability of planetary change. To be sure talking about crisis grabs our attention and motivates us to action but it can also skew our thinking and cause unintended harm. And this brings me to crisis epistemology. Crisis epistemology in the sense in which Kyle White discusses in, in an article in this volume I have up on the slide, crisis epistemology emphasizes urgent instrumental thinking, that is means end thinking and linear solution oriented action. It regards our present world as having been stable, but as now facing unprecedented and imminent disaster, and therefore as demanding emergency thinking and planning. Crisis epistemology fixates on a particular end, climate mitigation, and extracts it from the larger complexity of social and political history and from ecological planetary dynamics. Crisis epistemology looks at the world from what historians would call a presentist perspective. What this means is a perspective that takes for granted the ideas and values of our present culturally dominant worldview, which is basically modernity and late capitalism. Crisis epistemology, even when it recognizes modernity and capitalism as problems, downplays other cultural and historical perspectives. And this happens particularly with indigenous perspectives. Indigenous peoples have long endured the destruction of traditional habitats and experienced the present world as dystopian because of settler colonialism. So whereas crisis epistemology takes recent history as stable and sees climate change as an imminent catastrophe or even indeed an apocalypse to use a religious language, indigenous peoples have, have been experiencing instability and crisis for centuries and already inhabit a world their ancestors would have perceived as dystopian. Crisis epistemology can lead us to perpetuate injustices such as the forced resettlement of indigenous peoples in Africa for the sake of national climate mitigation projects in Kenya, for example. Crisis epistemology promotes linear means and thinking where we think of the end as climate mitigation while injustice or oppression is something to be addressed later as if it were possible to separate climate, the biosphere, justice and oppression when they're deeply entangled with each other. To take another example, this is argued by Amitav Ghosh in his book, The Great Derangement, Asia has played a pivotal role in setting in motion the events leading to climate change, both as a result of being a resource for occupying European colonial powers and as a result of its own rapid industrialization. Also, the great majority of potential victims of climate change are in Asia. So no climate mitigation strategy can work globally unless it works in Asia, 
Yet the crisis epistemology discourse of climate change remains largely Eurocentric. Now, please understand that we have to grasp these points properly. My point is not at all to deny that we face a climate crisis. It's that crisis epistemology isn't helpful for dealing with it. On the contrary, crisis epistemology is actually part of the problem. It fixates on linear thinking as a way to find certainty. But complexity, uncertainty, and unpredictability require a different kind of thinking, a different epistemology from crisis epistemology. This is something that the systems theorist Gregory Bateson insisted on decades ago in his book, Steps to an Ecology of Mind. And Gregory Bateson, of course, was a huge influence and, and friend, huge influence on and friend with Francisco Varela. The term epistemology looms large in his work, as does the term ecology. Bateson uses the term epistemology to mean the theory of knowledge implicit in a worldview, how we think about what knowledge is and what it means to go about seeking or, or trying to gain knowledge. As an aside, Bateson was the first scientist in 1967 to warn of a greenhouse effect, this was his term, that could lead to runaway climate change. This recent book published a few years ago, Runaway by Anthony Cheney, this gives an intellectual history of Bateson's life and work. Now, Bateson didn't use the term crisis epistemology. Instead, he talked more generally about what he called human conscious purpose and its effects on adaptation. Consciousness in this context means selective awareness guided by purpose or intention or motivated by purpose or intention. And it's inherently exclusionary to use the term that uh, John Donne called to our attention last night. The idea that when we focus on something, we thereby exclude other things, or we could even put it the other way, that we exclude things and thereby focus on things. So consciousness in this context means selective awareness guided by a purpose or intention. And the idea is that we have only a partial awareness of the events that make up the complex system of our bodies coupled to our environment, including society and the biosphere. And our partial awareness is biased by our intentions and purposes. The problem is that we forget this. Instead, we rely exclusively on abstract instrumental reason which distills the biases of conscious purpose. And we implement this procedure in powerful technologies that quickly overtake our conscious purposes. And of course, the greenhouse effect as Bateson called it or, or climate change as a result of human action is a powerful instance of this. So here's another way to put the problem. Conscious purpose forces a linear structure onto the nonlinear and entangled networks that make up the complex systems of the body and the environment, which Bateson calls the total mind. He uses the term total mind to refer to the entangled system of the body and the environment. So here in the diagram with the red arrow, what I've done is I've drawn a causal pathway from the peripheral gray circle on the right to the peripheral gray circle on the left. And there is indeed a causal relationship between those two circles. The circles represent processes embedded in a complex um, network of processes. But that particular pathway that I've singled out as an observer excludes its mediation by other processes, including a complex entangled self-organizing network that's represented by the interwoven black circles. And this is a figure that I love to use that comes from Ezekiel Di Paolo and, and I will be using throughout this talk. So the idea is that on the one hand, consciousness is biased selective awareness. And on the other hand, being driven by purpose, consciousness has feedback effects on the total system. And this leads in Bateson's diagnosis to maladaptation as evidenced by the climate crisis. He writes, 
if consciousness has feedback upon the remainder of mind, and if consciousness deals only with a skewed sample of the events of the total mind, then there must exist a systematic, i.e. non-random, difference between the conscious views of self and the world and the true nature of self and the world. Such a difference must distort the processes of adaptation. Now, this brings us to the difference between wisdom, wisdom is a word that Bateson uses, between wisdom and conscious purpose. Wisdom is knowledge, sensitivity to awareness of the larger complex system of which purpose determined conscious selection is but a small and skewed sampling. Purpose of consciousness pulls out sequences that don't have the loop structure that's characteristic of the whole system. And repeatedly doing this and forgetting the larger entanglement is to be unwise. It's not that we can't for certain purposes and certain limited contexts pull out sequences from the larger loop structure. It's that if we continually do this in a way that excludes the larger structure so that we forget it, that is to be unwise. And as Bateson says, lack of systemic wisdom is always punished. We may say that the biological systems, the individual, the culture, and the ecology are partly living sustainers of their component cells or organisms. But the systems are nonetheless punishing of any species unwise enough to quarrel with its ecology. And we, of course, have been engaged in a protracted quarrel now for quite some time. And I don't think it's uh, to be doubted who ultimately will prevail in that kind of quarrel. All right, so let's connect this to crisis epistemology. The connection is twofold. First, crisis epistemology is a response to a crisis created by conscious purpose, so the climate crisis. And second, crisis epistemology itself is a form of conscious purpose and thereby exacerbates things. For example, by perpetuating distortions and injustices, even if with the best of intentions. Now, the question then is, what are the correctives and alternatives to conscious purpose? And remarkably, Bateson's answer is love by which he means mutual recognition and care in the I-thou relation. He actually refers to, to Martin Buber here, to Buber's writings on the I-thou relation, the I-you relation. And his thinking is that we have to regard our relationship to the ecosystem or the biosphere as fundamentally an I-thou relation rather than an I-it relation. It's not that we can't for certain purposes at certain times and adopt an I it stance. But if we make that foundational, then we have undercut out the, the ethical uh, wellspring of our being in the world. So we have to relate to the biosphere or ecosystem fundamentally as an I thou relationship. And this entails a huge shift in the ethical languages of European thought, Greek and European thought, you could say, or let's say Mediterranean and European thought, you could say that this means relating to the biosphere as a manifestation of the good or as an end in itself and not as a mere thing to be treated instrumentally by us for our conscious purposes. In short, wisdom, we could say understanding complexity, requires love and love, which here means care, goodwill, devotion, Love requires wisdom. Now, if crisis epistemology is a manifestation and application of conscious purpose, and if the corrective and alternative to conscious purpose is wisdom and love, then what would a wise and loving epistemology be? Kyle White gives an answer when he juxtaposes crisis epistemology to what he calls an epistemology of coordination, which he finds in certain indigenous intellectual traditions. In White's words, coordination epistemology means ways of knowing the world that emphasize the importance of moral bonds, of, of kinship relationships, for generating the responsible capacity to respond to constant change. To put it another way, 
Coordination epistemology is a way of knowing the world that sees it as constituted by ethical bonds and mutual responsibilities, as in kinship relationships. The world isn't an it or isn't simply an it. The world is a thou or a you to whom we have an ethical bond. Coordination epistemology doesn't frame crises the way crisis epistemology does. It's not that crises aren't recognized, but they're not framed in the same way. Climate change isn't framed as an imminent emergency that will disrupt a previously stable world. Instead, the crisis is a manifestation of the long-standing and ongoing disruptions to social relationships between settlers and indigenous peoples, rich and poor peoples, and human beings in the biosphere. The task then is to repair those relationships and establish new ones. And this requires both wisdom and love in Bates and Sense, understanding complexity, wisdom, and how it's skewed by conscious purpose, and reframing our relationship to the ecosystem as an I-thou relationship. Okay, so what I want to do now in the talk is to generalize some of these ideas in terms of the inactive approach in cognitive science, which was inaugurated by Francisco Varela. And this is a contemporary intellectual heir of Bateson's systems theory epistemology and can give us some scientific concepts and tools for coordination epistemology. So these on the slide, these books are the principal works I'll be drawing from if you, if you want to dive into the, the, the details of what I'm going to present now. The core ideas of the inactive approach are that mind consists in the organism environment relation, that cognition is sense making in and through embodied action, and that sense making happens through emergent self individuating systems dynamically coupled to their environment. So, to unpack that, I have to unpack these concepts or ideas. Emergent self-individuating systems, sense-making, participatory sense-making, and cognitive ecology. So I'm going to go through these um, in, a, in a quick and sketchy way. So first of all, emergent self-individuating systems, this image depicts the idea of a self-individuating system. The arrows represent enabling relations or relations of conditioning. And the black circles and arrows form a tightly interdependent network, a unitary network. The green arrows indicate conditioning relations that influence the interdependent network, as well as conditioning relations from the network into its environment. So the whole interdependent network of the black circles is emergent, self-individuating, and precarious. That is because, in the case of the black circles, Every process influences another process and is influenced by another process in that network. So it has closure in the mathematical sense. The whole network emerges as a kind of unity. It individuates itself in coupling with the environment. And it's precarious in the sense that any process in the black, uh, in the system or network of black circles, any process left to its own outside of its embedding in the network would tend to run down or atrophy. So the processes are, are precarious in that sense. Now we can use this kind of network to specify what we mean by emergence, which is another theme of our, of our meeting here. In a self-individuating system, like a cell, for example, a living cell, local interactions generate large scale patterns. Local interactions would be say enzymatic regulations in a biochemical network. Local interactions generate large scale patterns which shape local interactions. So the, the local enzymatic regulations and things like um, protein synthesis and gene regulation, all of that happens because it's bound up in this protected interdependent network of the intracellular um, system with the, with the semi-permeable membrane. So the large scale pattern shapes local interactions, which of course generate large scale patterns and so on, so that part and whole determine each other. And what we count as part and what we count as whole has to do with, in a way, how we bring an analytic perspective. 
Now, living systems like cells aren't just self-individuating. They also have adaptivity, that is, a capacity to adaptively regulate their coupling with the environment according to their own vital norms, according to what they register as advantageous or disadvantageous to themselves, as in the case of a bacterium that swims up the sucrose gradient or swims away from, from toxins from heavy metals. So sense-making is the ability of a system to regulate its operation and its relation to the environment according to its own viability conditions. And such a system is an agent, that is to say it has an agency in the sense of a self-regulation. Its adaptive self-individuation exhibits or constitutes agency. So this is another depiction of this idea. This again is from Ezekiel de Paolo on the left. In the, in the drawing, some environmental flows contribute to self-individuation while others are actively rejected. And then on the right, as a result, self-individuation regulates the system's boundary conditions and coupling with the environment. Hence, the system constitutes an agent. Think of the difference between a living cell and a candle flame. A candle flame individuates as a stable pattern, a stable macrophysical pattern, but it doesn't self-individuate in the sense of regulating its own boundary conditions in the way that a living cell does in coupling with the environment. The third inactive idea is participatory sense-making. And this comes from Hannah Dieger's work. In participatory sense-making, sense-making activities become interdependent and mutually constituting. The sense-making of multiple agents is mutually modulated in their interactive encounters. Think of a conversation or a jazz improv or a dance, or even how we walk down the street and regulate our interactions with other people according to our shared understanding of social norms of how close we should be, how far away we should be, all of which of course has been altered by the pandemic and is a subject of um, delicacy and obvious of, obviously of, of, of tension and controversy. So the idea here is that this interactive dynamic dynamics forms a self-sustaining pattern for a given time in a common space of relational engagement. This is in the case of say social animal life, mammalian life especially, and obviously in human life entirely regulated by cultural norms. So there's a double influence between the larger pattern and the agent's self-individuating activity where agents directly participate in each other's sense-making. So this brings me then to the last idea that I'm very quickly sketching of an act of thinking, the idea of cognitive ecologies. And this comes from the work of Edwin Hutchins. Here we use an act of cognitive science to study what Hutchins calls cognitive ecosystems which are constituted by participatory sense-making. A cognitive ecosystem is a system of relationships among cognitive, that is sense-making processes in a community. And it comprises multiple entangled networks of participatory sense-making. He's particularly interested in naval ships in the case of say the massive modern technologically mediated um, naval ship or ships Polynesian, Micronesian navigation in which people interact and regulate each other's activity in order to navigate across vast differences. He writes, all high level cognition is a product of a system that includes cultural practices, habits of attending, so that also means habits of ignoring, connecting back to our idea of exclusion, and ways of using the body in interaction with one's material and social surrounds. This is true for abstract high-level cognition, like doing math. It's true for engaged high-level cognition, like empathetic listening. It's true for physically skilled high-level cognition, like sailing or, or dancing. Notice that this means that culture is absolutely critical to cognition. Cultural practices orchestrate cognitive capacities like attention, metacognition, selective awareness, and thereby enact cognitive performances like navigation and sea travel or ritual and meditation. It also follows that if two cognitive systems include different cultural practices, the two systems can have different cognitive 
cognitive properties, even if the neural activations are the same. So brain activity all by itself doesn't determine the cognitive properties of the system. The wider context of the body and the environment matters. It also follows that under most conditions, locating cognitive processes at the level of the neural networks gets the boundaries of the cognitive system wrong. A better unit of analysis is the enculturated body world system. In short, the mind isn't in the head. All right, so let me pull some threads together now. We've seen that crisis epistemology is an expression of conscious purpose and it distorts complexity, violates ethical bonds and is generally unwise. In contrast, coordination epistemologies in White's words, organize knowledge through the vector of kinship relationships, that is through ethical bonds. Kinship here is, is, is a metonymy for ethical bonds. It doesn't necessarily mean literal, you know, blood kin. So coordination of epistemology organizes knowledge through the vector of kinship relationships, through ethical bonds, including ethical bonds to the more than human world, that is to the biosphere. An active cognitive science, particularly through its ideas of emergence, participatory sense-making and cognitive ecologies provides scientific materials for cultivating systemic wisdom in Bateson's sense and coordination epistemologies in White's terms. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is hope. And this connects to the talk I gave a few days ago, which you can see also at the Upaya YouTube channel, which was entirely about hope. So I'm picking up um, a few threads from, from that talk. So there's, there's overlap now between what I'm going to say here and, and what I said on, on Wednesday. The concept of hope, I think, is widely misunderstood, I think, especially in certain Buddhist circles today, and I, I talked about that on Wednesday, where hope is often understood as tied to fear and to desiring and expecting a particular good outcome, and therefore as a kind of craving or attachment. But this isn't the only kind of hope, and indeed, it's not the deepest and most important kind. In fact, conceiving of hope this way, I think, is basically mistaken because it understands, it misunderstands the deep phenomenological structure of hope. And this point, I think, is especially now, especially important now in the context of the climate crisis. So I want to end by saying some things about hope. And the slide has a painting. Some of you may know this painting by George Frederick Watts, who's a 19th century English symbolist painter. The painting is ambiguous because it can't be interpreted using traditional symbolisms, traditional religious symbolisms, for example. But one thing Watts said about the painting is very interesting. He said, I made hope blind, so expecting nothing. And the thought here is that Hope isn't the same as optimistic desire or expectation. I'll come back to this point in a minute. And there's also a difference between ignorant hope, where ignorance is opposed to wisdom, and hope that we might call hope in the face of a radical unknowing, an unknowing hope in the face of radical uncertainty. So I think this painting is, is, is a sort of beautiful depiction of, of these ambiguities. All right, I want to, since we're talking about, or since I'm talking about the climate crisis here, I want to start with this statement by Greta Thunberg. She says, she said this in a statement to um, political leaders in 2019, I think. She said, I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day, and then I want you to act. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if our house is on fire because it is. As an aside, uh, for the Buddhists who are in the audience, you'll know that the burning house is a powerful metaphor in the Lotus Sutra for samsara. Now, of course, I understand why she says these things, and I admire her activism and commitment. And of course, I agree that we do face a crisis and we do need to act. But I want to suggest that nevertheless, there's a kind of hope we need without which we either can't act or we'll wind up acting in the harmful ways typical of crisis epistemology. 
And the kind of hope I'm thinking of is what philosopher Gabriel Marcel calls absolute hope, though I would prefer to call it unconditional hope or intransitive hope. And to my mind, his writings, particularly this article or, or um, chapter of this book called Sketch of a Phenomenology and a Metaphysic of Hope, these are some of the best philosophical writings on hope. And I want to use them to present an idea of what I will call inactive hope. Marcel says we have to distinguish between hope that and hope. I hope that requires an object, is relative, that, relative to that object, and is motivated by desire, and hence is bound to the self. It's a conditional hope. But unconditional hope, or intransitive hope, is an open and patient orientation to the good. It's not I hope that, but simply I hope. Marcel's full formula for this kind of hope is I hope in thee for us, or I hope in you for us. This kind of hope isn't bound to the self, is expressed in love, and is embodied in communal life and recognition. Now, in our context of um, Upaya and generally speaking, a, a Buddhist community, this is a this is a interesting thing to take note of is that Marcel is writing from, he's sometimes called a Christian existentialist. He didn't use that term himself. He's writing from a perspective informed by Christianity and especially mystical Christian philosophy, Neoplatonism. And so there would be a very uh, interesting philosophical dialogue we could have about the ways that a, some Buddhist perspectives and this Christian Neoplatonic mystical perspective, the ways in which they may intersect in certain ways and diverge in other ways. John Dunn and I have already started an email conversation about this. So this is a very rich topic that I just want to um, that I just want to flag. A closely related idea is philosopher Jonathan Lear's idea of radical hope. This book, Radical Hope, was published, I think, in 2006. Jonathan Lear is at the University of Chicago. He's a philosopher who is strongly informed by psychoanalysis, by Freudian by the Freudian tradition. And he talks about radical hope as a kind of hope in which one holds out for goodness despite one's not having the concepts to understand what that goodness would exactly be. This kind of hope has to be open, not directed to a specific object or outcome because one can't anticipate exactly what form the good should or will take. And he's concerned with this idea of hope in cases of cultural devastation when one finds oneself in a situation where one must hope, but the object of one's hope is unimaginable. He sees it, that is Lear sees it, exemplified in the actions of Plenty Coup, the last great chief of the Crow Nation, who led his people to give up their hunter warrior of life and voluntarily move onto reservations. Plenty Coup exemplifies courage and hope even though he couldn't envision what the new life would be for his people. Now, I, I think it's very important to say here that I find Lear's treatment of this case, despite being very moving and very powerful, I find it to be problematic. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. He doesn't engage with contemporary indigenous thinkers and their scholarship. They don't have any voice or presence in his writing. He comes perilously close to pronouncing on matters such as the conflict between Plenty Coup and the Sioux chief Sitting Bull, that it's not his place to decide. And he arguably distorts the experience of the Crow people in certain ways in order to serve his own philosophical ends. Nevertheless, I think his point that there is a kind of hope in which one holds out for goodness, despite not having the concepts to understand what that goodness would be, I think that's a very important point. It means that active hope can't always be hope for particular outcomes. Sometimes it's radical hope for something unimaginable. It has to sit in a kind of unknowing. I want to bring in Roshi Joan here because she has made a distinction that I think is also fundamentally important here between what she calls ordinary hope and wise hope. So I want to read some words from her writings to you. She says, ordinary hope is based in desire wanting an outcome that could well be different from what will actually happen. Not getting what we hoped for is usually experienced as some kind of misfortune. Someone who is hopeful in this way has an expectation that always hovers in the background, the shadow of fear that one's wishes will not be fulfilled. 
This ordinary hope is a subtle expression of fear and a form of suffering. But wise hope is not seeing things unrealistically, but rather seeing things as they are, including the truth of suffering, both its existence and our capacity to transform it. It's when we realize we don't know what will happen that this kind of hope comes alive. In that spaciousness of uncertainty is the very space we need to act. This kind of hope is expressed in action in what Joanna Macy calls active hope. It's the engaged expression of wise hope or unconditional hope. So let me pull these threads together under the heading of enactive hope. Enactive hope, specifically unconditional hope or wise hope, is a kind of participatory sense making. It requires systemic wisdom in Bateson's sense and coordination epistemology instead of crisis epistemology. It requires refusing hopelessness and despair, which presume to know the future and express cravings for certainty and finality. And it also re requires refusing linear crisis thinking that simplifies complexity. And it is a practice. It's something that has to be continually enacted and be made fresh in every moment because things are constantly changing and impermanent. Let me conclude by recalling Marcel's formula for unconditional hope, which is I hope in thee for us, or I hope in you for us. For Marcel, hope, as I said, is orientation to the good as such, not to a particular desired good. And the good as such is love, which is embodied in our communal human life and recognition of each other. Love here resonates with words like compassion or karuna in Sanskrit or ren, benevolence in Chinese. So there's the English word love that expresses this idea, but there's a wider semantic valence, I think, across many languages for what Marcel is talking about. But I like the word love because it's his word and it is its strength is the rootedness in the tradition from which he's working from. So for him, this is embodied in our communal human life and recognition of each other. The thought I would leave you with is that we need to enlarge the thee and us of I hope in thee for us to include the more than human world of the planetary biosphere. It's this kind of kinship bond and participatory sense-making that we have to cultivate that we have to enact to deal with our planetary climate crisis. Thank you. Evan, thank you so much. Just wonderful as always. Thank you. So Hannah, we're going to turn it over to you. We have uh, a little less than 20 minutes total time uh, for uh, discussion for your observations in particular. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Evan. That was a really wonderful, beautiful talk. Um, very, very, very rich in concepts and ideas and, and stretch of what is going on in the thinking. And actually, I have two remarks, uh, which I hope I can formulate well, that in a way might even try to stretch it further, what we are thinking about here. Um, I read uh, Radical Hope as well um, by Lear, and um, I have a specific question maybe about his approach. In a way, um, he also conceives of um, Plenty Coup and uh, the Crow Nation as in um, having some kind of um, idealized past, perhaps, in which um, he, he kind of says that um, uh, the Crow Nation is losing its meaning, but he, he uh, and, and therefore having ha has difficulty with en envisioning a future. Um, and Plenty Coup gets out of it by having this radical hope. But in a way, the, the past that um, Lear thinks about for uh, the Crow Nation is kind of idealized and enclosed as if it was a culture that didn't encounter other cultures, whereas they did encounter other cultures. And so in a way, um, when you said, let me look at your slide quickly, that um, an active hope um, uh, doesn't um, 
An act of hope refuses hopelessness and despair, which presume to know the future and express cravings for certainty and finality, that also can reach back into the past where we might think there was a better time um, and a better, fuller meaning, exhaustive meaning. And hanging on to such a past may also be a danger. So both future and past could be determined too much. Um, that was my first reflection. Um, maybe I'll say the second one as well. Um, and the second one is, um, so I wonder sometimes in how far is this way of thinking that you presented, this kind, this um, complex systems thinking, wisdom thinking, uh, uh, nonlinear perspective and so on, in how far is it mainstream and could it be mainstream and how is there, it seems to me that there's, is it the case that it's always in the human world in, globally that there is going to be a tension between uh, a linear, um, instrumental, divisive perspective and uh, a complex systems wisdom connection perspective. Is, is there always going to be a tension between that? Is that just also built into humanity somehow? Um, is Western science ready to take on this kind of thinking? Um, <laughs> and what would it require for Western science to be ready for it? And will it happen? I don't, these, it's a big question. It's another way of maybe making the question bigger yet. Um, yeah, these are my reflections. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, John Dunn. Wait, I, wait, Al, oh, Al. Yeah, yes, Al, please. I'd, I'd love to hear uh, Evan's response. Ah. Got, yeah, if you don't mind, before we jump No, that's in. fine. I've, I've, it was uh, John's comment, I think it was going to tie in to Hannah's and then we we're going to go to Evans, but Evan, let's go to you first. Yeah, those are those are really uh, both, uh, I think, extremely important comments. I think uh, the point that you make about the past, I think, is uh, that's that's a really important point. Um, that's partly what I was alluding to when I said that he distorts the experience of the Crow people to serve his own philosophical ends. Um, uh, that. Um, there's a way in which he understands their past, although he does talk about their, you know, their warfare with with other other groups and tribes. There's a way in which he presents the past as having been um, fixed in a particular way, and and then the future as a radical break with it, despite the fact that actually they continued many of their practices, their traditional practices. Uh, you know, in, in their life in the reservation. And so <clears throat> this, this particular narrative that he's offering, you know, the, the concept that he's working with, I think is very important, but the actual narrative in which he, he articulates the concept, I think is, is problematic for that reason. And I think the point, the, the point about the past, both in that particular case, and then more generally, as you, you know, drew out the implications is, is very important. And indeed, I would say that that's what Kyle White is concerned with also when he talks about crisis epistemology. It's a certain vision of the past. The past was, we take the past for granted, it's fixed and stable, and now everything is being disrupted. And that's that's not even true for our our own path, past. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of construct for ourselves, but it's especially not true in the face of many, you know, many, other, many other peoples who we, um, who we are uh, enmeshed with, so I think that's I think that's really important. the The point about science, I mean, this is a this is a huge open question. Um, this is something that actually Adam Frank and I and Marcelo Gleiser were writing about in you know our book called The Blind Spot. I I would note, and you know, here it would be interesting to to hear what uh, John would say. You know, we see, for example, in the Indian philosophical tradition, in the form of pramana theory. The idea of instrumental thinking, of you know, causal instrumental thinking, you know, first articulated, you know, in in Nyaya, Brahminical epistemological theories, and then you know, very much developed by Buddhists. And that's you know, that that is something that's that's fundamentally important for us in how we pragmatically you know find our way in the world. The difference, it seems to me, between that context, actually, Gennard and Guineri has written a very good paper on this, between that context and what we might call science in that context, 
I put the word in scare quotes because this is a problematic term, and science today is that we have massively amplified the power of that thinking through technology, through the scientific workshop that is a special place that we've created for refining and distilling concepts and procedures and technologies. And so I think the task for us going forward is to balance things, to, to find some kind of balance where we remember that there's a, there's a much bigger, more complicated, uh, you know, enmeshed network in which we are placed. And if we just emphasize that kind of thinking, uh, especially through the power of technology, and this is in a way Bateson's point, we, we will destroy uh, our own habitat. I mean, that, that's, I think, the challenge in a way that, that we face. Thank you, Evan. Hannah, do you wish to respond anything in return to Evan? Yeah, I would. I, I was also, I'm also kind of wondering what it has to do with, with uh, dominance, because in a way, I mean, Kyle White's idea that um, we, that this may not be a crisis, or in a way, what, what he's conveying and his thinking, I think, is this may not be a crisis. And so just juxtaposing, okay, so maybe for, for many other people in the world and Western people, this isn't such an urgent thing, perhaps. Or we could also see it as not urgent. And that immediately brings a kind of, okay, maybe it's okay, we can we can take time maybe to deal with, with this. And so um, the dominant view is, is this determining, uh, boxing in urgency, time slices instead of time flowing. Um, but that seems to be the dominant discourse that determines so much. So, how, and how does that, that ha seems to hang together also with this instrumental thinking? It's also one that attempts to dominate uh, and seems to. Um, um, I only have the word in, 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 in other language, it seems to manage to dominate things. Uh, that, that seems to be related to it somehow. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, John Dunn, since Evan had invited uh, your observation or, or comment, do you want to have something to say? Uh, that's that's Nandi in the background uh, applauding Evan's talk. Um, uh, I, I yes, I, I mean I have a couple of things. I just wanted to note I really appreciated Hannah's observation because you know this idea of being free of hope and fear, redok meba, is actually a meditation instruction. It's not really an instruction for off the cushion, although people sometimes take it that way, but it's really a meditation instruction. But it's also accompanied by, so Red Dog Maper is about the future, being free of hopes and fears. And this is really what Roshi John was talking about is like, you know, unwise hope. It's expectation, positive and negative. But the past, also you're meant to be free of, and this is really our techniques to inhibit mental time travel while you're on the cushion, right? Be free of regrets and attachment to the past. Yeah. So I think, Hannah, you know, it's really interesting to think about, well, what, you know, if you're going to have this kind of new kind of hope. And by the way, even though I, I like very much this idea, I'm not sure it's really like the deep, it, I'm not so sure that it characterizes the phenomenological structure of expectation. So I think it's important not to say that this is, you know, if we use the word hope to refer to expectation, maybe we actually need different terms, but I'm not so sure that it really characterizes expectation. Uh, but um, in any case, I think it's really important to think about, well, what kind, what does this mean about our attitude to the past? And I, I, I really like the dialogue you had there, but I think there's more to be said. And we'll quickly say that in terms of what your comment you made, Evan, and I don't know actually the paper you're referring to by Jan Arden, I'd love to know. The Buddhist approach to this was to say that all of that instrumental pramana, all of that instrumental epistemology is sambhyavaharika. It's all conventional. It's all relative to our life world in which the community of knowers are sharing what are called drda vasana, shared imprints or conditioning. And so within that shared life world, they, that instrumental cognition works, but it's conventional. And actually it in the end will always lead to suffering, in fact. So you can make your way in that shared life world, but if you're, if you're seeking to transform it or transcend it, 
you've got to let go of that kind of instrumental cognition and come to something that's non-instrumental, the ultimate pramana, which of course is, you know, non-dual awareness. I wanted to say one quick thing that Lisa Dale Miller raised in a question, which is really interesting, which is the idea that could we call this hope actually faith? And if you translated that into the into the Buddhist world, it would sound much more like of the three kinds of faith, what's called prasanna, right? The, this clear faith, it's not about, it's not intentionally oriented. It's just a kind of experience like a stone dropped in muddy water. It suddenly becomes clear. Just wondering how that would work. That, that's a great point from Lisa. Let, let me quickly actually respond to that. Just that last point. Um, so, of course, in Marcel's discourse, which, as I said, is you know coming out of Christianity and, and Platonism, hope, faith, and love are completely intertwined concepts. And so, if we're thinking of it um, cross culturally, then we have an interesting. Uh, we have an interesting. What's the word? Exercise is not it sound makes it sound too trivial, but we have an interesting effort to look at you know, divergences and, and convergences among hate, uh, among hope, faith, and love in that context, and then resonant terms in either, you know, Sanskrit or, or Tibetan or Chinese in a, in a Buddhist context. And that's something I've actually gotten very interested in, in my own thinking and writing recently. Um, so that's a, that's a very good comment. I mean, a very important comment to bring out, thought to bring out. Thank you. So, um, thank you. I'd love to ask you a question, John, and thank you for uh, referring to uh, that that little article, and also I've been uh, quite a few papers on hope in really trying to sort it out since uh, in Buddhism conventionally, we uh, have uh, a, an attitude toward hope, which um, uh, John has articulated, and you have to a certain degree. Um, I would love for you to speak about the relationship between unknowing and imagination. And I say oh, this, um, yeah, I, I'm asking the question because, and there's a, I, I'm, I'm shy to ask the question behind the question, but I'll ask it. And this um, has to do with uh, the means for uh, cultivating uh, the potential for the intersectionality of unknowing and imagination in order to transform how we view reality. Yeah, wow, that's an amazing question, Roshi. It's, uh, I guess, you know, what immediately comes to mind is actually uh, as a technique, you could say, or a perspective is actually tantric practice. And one of the key aspects of tantric practice that is said to be especially effective is the way in which one reimagines oneself in the world as, you know, essentially heaven, right? The Buddha realm, the mandala oneself as a deity, everyone one sees as one's walking down the street, tantric practice is supposed to be 24 seven, you know, so they're all deities, you're walking through, you know, paradise, this sort of reimagining of the world in this way, is at the same time, it's a reimagining that knows that it is unreal, yeah, that feels unreal. And I think there's something, there's something there as well, that sort of sense of you know, an unknowing of if we then are thinking about our own future, the incapacity to the knowledge that whatever future we think of is always an is always an illusion, of course, because the future does not exist. It's always an act of imagination. And yet at the same time, we can build a world for ourselves that actually impacts the way in which we behave now at the same, even while we know that it is like a dream. So I don't know if that answered your, your question, but it's almost that sense of living the dream, so to speak, that maybe is part of, especially the core of tantric practice. That's, that's a, a wonderful uh, perspective, John. I, um, uh, what I would also appreciate, uh, Evan, I, I'd like to drop that question as well into, uh, into your lap um, uh, because, uh, yeah, I'd like to he hear how you reflect on that question. The, the question of imagination. A, yeah, the intersectionality of imagination and unknowing or not knowing or beginner's mind or wisdom, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, emptiness, so to yeah. speak. And um, also uh, not to say, how do we transform how we view the world, um, you know, or help uh, create the conditions where we can uh, move into uh, 
uh, the the view or the the uh, internal uh, means for uh, perceiving things openly without um, uh, exclusive knowledge mediating how we perceive things, but also with possibility, you know, uh, present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, through the means of imagination. Yeah, I mean, that's an extremely, extremely rich and multifaceted um, topic. Uh, I, I would say, or what I, what I find uh, relevant to thinking about this is a distinction actually that's, you know, that comes out of European romanticism, both in art and in philosophy that distinguishes between fantasy and imagination. Yeah. And fantasy works with, works with kind of fixed, definite images. And uh, it, it involves being kind of captivated and spellbound by them. And Marcel, in his writings about hope, is very explicit that to the extent that you fantasize about outcomes, that your hope is illusory. He actually uses the word imagination to talk about this, whereas, whereas I would prefer to use the word fantasy, whereas imagination, in contrast to fantasy in, in the way that, say, Coleridge or um, other romantic thinkers would make the distinction, is imagination is a creative and synthetic mental activity that is required for us to envision situations creatively. And, you know, from a Coleridgean perspective, if you wanted to put it that way, you know, you could look at Tantra as, as, as that kind of um, imaginative practice. And it's the, it's the space, if you will, in which we, in which we generate scenarios and possibilities and consider things counterfactually. And, that allows us to step back from the particular linear fixities that we're working with in our instrumental thinking. And this kind of imaginative thinking is absolutely crucial for science, of course. I mean, you know, Einstein, you know, imagining, you know, what it's like in the elevator, you know, with an accelerating frame of reference um, or, you know, or inertial, I forget now in the elevator, which one he was using <laughs> that to illustrate. Um, Adam will know, yeah. Um, um, so, I mean, this is fundamental to, to scientific thinking. It's the, the point is that imagination there is, is about creativity and creativity, another notion that's central to hope in Marcel's thinking, because open hope is a, is a creative transformation of the self and of desire in a way that, um, loosens the, the, the fixations that fantasy deals with. Um, so, so those are, you know, some of the thoughts that I would, you know, come back to your question with. Th thanks, so Evan. That's, Evan. that's rich. Mm -hmm. Rosie, do you have an opinion on this? I'm very curious. I feel like you have something to say on this matter. Well, I, you know, I think, uh, actually I, I had given this no thought till, uh, Evan's presentation. And then I suddenly realized how important the intersection between unknowing, not knowing, and imagination, th that intersection is really critical. So I look at it in a way, you know, it's a small Venn diagram. You know, there's this kind of heart at the middle of these two processes, one which um, is associated with, uh, uh, with wisdom, that is this unknowing, this openness, this unfiltered way of perceiving the world. And then there's this other process, which has to do with possibility. And um, only can arise, I feel, you know, out of uncertainty. Uh, you know, imagination um, doesn't generate from uh, the known and the instrumental per se. As uh, Evan is pointing to, it's a, it's a process that is uh, important for creativity. And I feel like the intersection between these two processes is actually what gives rise to wise hope. Thank you, Roshi. You know, we're running a, a little bit over our, our time schedule, and I, I don't want to cut into Adam's time, uh, and I also want to have a, just a little bit of time for a body kindness break. So um, I wonder, uh, Amy and, and Adam and Gabor, I know you as well as, as uh, uh, some of the participants, have some other things you'd like to discuss. We're going to have a longer discussion period after the next talk. So I wonder, since there'll be some relationships, if we can hold those to them, 
And at this point, let's take about an eight minute uh, body <laughs> kindness break. We were going to have 10, but uh, we're, we're considerably over already. So if we can do that, uh, coming back together at a quarter after the hour, and then we'll go uh, uh, immediately to our next talk. Thank you. Thanks.